Praise be to God. What another day, a beautiful, wonderful, glorious day. And, um, you know, uh, I spoke to Grace and Grace uh, asked her if she's got anybody to do devotion today. She told me um, primarily she hasn't. And uh, so I was said, well, I have to take the reins and uh, bring devotion today. There wasn't anything in particular that um, God was speaking to me about, but I remember the word I gave yesterday. And um, it, it again resonated in my spirit and the word and the scripture was, um, be not unequally, yoked with unbelievers for what communion have darkness and light um BL with Christ and um it sort of resonated in my spirit this morning and then um Donna was talking and then Keith came on and and began to express um his heart and uh, his fears also. And um, even this morning, I sort of, uh, God gave me a scripture to read. And, uh, you know, we, let us, let me say this, I'm coming up to, it's gonna be the 40th anniversary of our wedding. Grace and I, and uh, we're looking to celebrate it with our family on the platform, as well as our um, immediate family. And uh, it's it's in August. It's actually on the twentieth, but we invariably are looking at uh, possibly twenty six. But the thing is, um, the one thing I've realised is that. 40 years goes by very, very quickly. <laughs> and uh, even as I'm looking at myself, I'm thinking now I've got a gray beard. <laughs> I didn't realize I had a gray beard until about, uh, oh gosh, until about three months ago. Uh, well, actually it was during lockdown actually. Um, but, uh, cause I've never shaved before. I've never grown it before, grown a beard before. But the thing is, is that it's not so much the beard, but it's the over the years you gain so much wisdom and through experience in terms of relationship and uh, experience through listening to other people or observing other people's lives and experience through exercising the word of God and I really thought felt this morning that I I really wanted to speak about uh, relationships and I don't know where it will go, where it will lead, because I haven't studied it. I haven't done anything. But one of the one of the um, scriptures that comes home to me is um, Proverbs thirteen verse twelve, and um, Proverbs thirteen verse twelve says, um, "Hope deferred makes the heart." sick and uh, you might say what does that mean um hope deferred when you're when you're believing for something when you have your when you make your plans and you say by for instance if you say by a certain certain date i want to be i want to get this i want to achieve that i want to be i want to um gain or qualify in this area and it's not a matter of you, you can't set yourself goals but one of the things I realize in my own life and is that I have to constantly hear what God is saying and so even when society screams at me and says you should be doing that you should be doing this you, sh you should have gained this by your age. You should have accomplished this by your age. 
You know what? One thing I realize is that we're all unique in God. And no two people have, have been set this, exactly the same course in life. It's more important to have that intimacy with God and to know that, you know what? God, I'm hearing you. I'm hearing you. And be obedient to do what God instructs you to do. That way, you don't get anxious. You, you don't become anxious. You don't become fretful because you, you have placed that in the Father's hand. And the word of God says, be anxious for nothing, but in supplication with prayer, with thanksgiving, just make your requests be known unto God. And the God of peace, the God of peace <laughs> will keep your hearts and mind. In other words, it keep you sober. And um, I realized that there's decisions that we will make in life and there's experiences that we will have and these experiences are outside of hearing God. It's outside of what God has ordained for our lives. These experiences are based on our carnal nature, our flesh, what we desire, the I, me, and myself. I want to get something out of this. I want this for myself. And uh, hope deferred, hope deferred. In other words, you're hoping for something, but it's, it doesn't manifest. It's deferred. And when it's deferred, when it doesn't come in your time scale, according to the way you want it, under your conditions, you can, there's a level of frustration you can get into. You can get into an emotional turmoil. You can get into distress because you start looking at factors. You start comparing. You start looking at, oh, I'm this age. I've got this ability. I've got this inability. I've got, I've got, and hope deferred when it's deferred when it doesn't manifest you get sick in your spirit you get sick in your soul you get troubled you get agitated and there's a sense of yearning for this thing to happen and um i've learned through experience that i'm not saying that i don't have a vision i do have a vision i do have a vision but I don't know the path. I don't know my exact path towards what God has called me to. And so what I do, I, on a daily basis, I trust God. And when I say trust God, I might not have the means at the time to do what God calls me to do, but you know what? My source and my ability comes from God. And so I have to trust God. Um, there's a lot of things that are stirring in my spirit. And uh, because I want to help each and every one of you, because I know that some of you have been, um, probably all of you have been in some type of relationship. And when you've been in a relationship, things don't always go the way you would have dreamed it. We Sometimes we have this fantasy about what a, a relationship should be in terms of whether it be a husband or wife or girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever, but we believe that it should be almost um, Disney-like. In other words, it should all be all bliss and joy. I mean, you know, there's always a story with a Disney film, but the thing is it, it always seemingly turns out well in the end. But the reality is that if you trust God, Trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. But in all your ways, in all your ways, not some of your ways, because sometimes we don't want to hear what God has to say because we're, 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 we're consumed and we're acting our own personal desires. And so we will step out of the boundaries of the, the boundaries of God's word to accomplish certain things. And we know that um, because we have a, the person of the Holy Spirit dwells on the inside of us, we know when we're, not, <laughs> when we're not in the right place or we're not doing the right thing. We know because the Spirit of God will speak to us. But we sometimes we, we want to deafen our ears, whether our physical ears 
or emotional ears or a spirit we want to deafen our ears to what is what the holy spirit is saying to us and then we go off and do what we need to do only to find that it's only satisfied satisfies for a fleeting moment until the reality dawns on us dawns on us that what was all that about why did i allow myself to be led astray by my emotions or my own desires it is important it is important to ultimately commit everything to god and i say that because i'm not perfect in any means but experience tells me that the gr grass always looks greener on the other side <laughs> and it's not as green as you think it is <laughs> when you get there you find out that it's asphalt or it's a uh, fake grass it's, in other words it's not as real as, it, as as you imagine and sometimes it i mean someone said to me the other day um you know it's because the, the fake grass or artificial grass always has the appearance of being um forever green and i'm thinking what is the virtues of in fake grass over um, natural grass? And obviously with fake grass, you don't have to lawn mow it. You don't have to mow the grass, so to speak. And it's, it's almost like you don't have to invest a lot of time into keeping it. But the reality is this. The person said something to me and said, um, you know what? I don't. Pref I prefer natural grass because fake grass it has the appearance of a little eff effort to maintain it. But the reality is that after a certain time, that grass can smell and get a bit and, and quote unquote um, get a bit funky. And I thought to myself, oh, and I began to imagine the smell and uh, who would be using it and such forth who would be using utilizing that fake grass and i thought to myself maybe i don't want to take um go for the fake grass because you know what it has a time when its use and its true value wears out and so it becomes smelly after a while and what you you delve yourself into things that you think may bring you um it, it's a short circuit to fulfillment and then what it does it brings you heartache and distress after a period of time it's something you might admit might recognize but you deny it and say you know what i'm i'm willing to bear the pains of committing myself in this area for the sake of just fulfilling certain desires or hopes or dreams that I have. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. And um, so many of us, we have, as I said, we have goals and ambitions, personal goals. But is it what the Lord has assigned for you? Is it what God has appointed for your life? We have to examine ourselves and trust God really really trust god and i don't know what it is um i as before i came on i just i i turned to a specific scripture and uh you know sometimes when you go through life and even when you've made wrong decisions people have a way of reminding you <laughs> in other words some people like to kick you when you're down and they like to expose your weaknesses or your fallibilities or whatever you call it. They like to do that. The enemy likes to, let me just say the enemy because the enemy will use people and oftentimes he will use the people that are the closest to you to do that. People that you would have put your, a certain amount of trust and confidence in. It's important to know that don't lean on the arms of flesh, but lean on the everlasting arms of God. 
He never disappoints. He never fails you. And um, I really just, uh, if I'm going to speak today, I may just as well speak as a father because I've been through a lot. We have been, Grace and I have been through a lot. But you know what? I look at it and I think to myself, and when I look at Grace, I remember one thing. And I, I rem this is a thing, she, she doesn't know this anyway. But nowadays I look at her and I think to myself, perfection. <laughs> you might say, perfect. how is how she perfection? Look, she does a lot of things that are not right, but perfection is something by, it's God's choosing. Let me just put it up, but it's God's choice. And, um, and uh, I say this, and I say it in all honesty, that I did not, and I was not looking for a wife at the, at the time when I encountered Grace, because I'm going to say this because there were many women, and I, I was young, I was young. There's many, many women that, uh, let me use the words that you used at that time when, I'm, when you're 21 and all that, that fancied me. And, uh, you know, one could have the pick. And you know, the thing is, is that I'm a Christian, but a lot of women were accessible to me. And they, and, well, they used to would say they love me or they care for me. And invariably, my heart did not say this is the person for me. And it might have been uh, impressed upon me to embrace the fact that someone could be lovely, someone be, could be kind, uh, that, you're in, that you have a friendship with. And you look at the person and say, well, what's wrong with the person? Why wouldn't you marry the person? And you'll find that the first thing that would happen, the first encounter that would not suit you in your relationship, you'll find like, oh, that's the seal. That's what tells me that I'm not, I can't get married to this person. And yet I remember, and I'm saying this because I remember when um, I saw Grace and I was, trust me, I didn't know I was gonna go down this path, but I, I just wanna impart some wisdom. I remember when I first met Grace, it was at a wedding and I'm, for some of you, you may have heard the story, but it was at a wedding and I was a photographer, the main photographer at this wedding. And I remember this young lady, Grace, was sitting beside me, but I didn't notice her. I did not notice her. And when I say not in a disrespectful way, but I did not notice her from the heart. And uh, I had a a friend was sitting on the left side of me and uh i'm sorry on the other side of grace to her left and um i was engaged in a conversation with her with my friend and uh i didn't even know that i was being rude really i was just you know you just caught up in a conversation and just grace said oh um would you like me to move so that you can have this conversation? And I, then I noticed her and then she, I said, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. And it sort of, the conversation with my friend sort of petered out, but then the, the service uh, continued. And I thinking to myself, oh, okay. Never thought anything more, but okay. Then there, we was called to, the vestry, so to speak. And uh, as a main photographer, you're taking the photographs and this was the signing of the register. And the vestry was so small that uh, there was about 10 bridesmaids or, or, and uh, um, ushers or what you call them. And um, it was tight in there and Grace was standing beside my friend and it's very, 
hard to get an angle to take everybody. So I was just focused in on my friend. I said, let me just take a photograph of you. And then Grace happened to be, because she was next to my friend, I took a photograph of the two of them. I thought, hmm, interesting, interesting. And um, when I took, obviously I took photographs of the bride and groom. <laughs> I couldn't shirk my responsibility, the reasons why I was there, main reasons, and the bridal party. And then it, that aspect that finished and the, uh, they were the two were now married and then we was out into the open and uh, now when we was open, out into open i continued to take photographs at random but again my friend was there and grace was beside her and i thought okay let me just take a photograph of my friend and then as i looked through the lens and grace was there i thought oh mm, took a quick photograph and then I sort of zoomed in on her and then I noticed her. I noticed her, I noticed her beauty. I noticed, it's almost like I could picture her heart, her soul. And I said, this is a beautiful person. And I thought, no, let me take a picture of a singly, like a single snap. And I zoomed in and, I, and it registered, something registered in me. But I did obviously, I just saw this person for the first time on this occasion. And I just remember, I remember um, it was now the reception. We were at the reception and uh, I was sitting there and the reception was going on. And uh, there was a moment, there was a moment when I, it was an open vision, it's a day vision. I, it was a day vision, God brought it to me. It was a day vision. And this day vision, I saw grace, but I saw myself laying beside her and it was not in a, it was nothing that had any sexual uh, orientation to it, but I saw myself laying beside her and I saw myself gazing at her and uh, gazing at her and just admiring her beauty. I thought to myself, what is this? It was, it, was a, it was an open vision. It was a day vision. And uh, nothing, there's nothing sexual about it, but it, it was so real. And then, um, you know, when you try to shake yourself and you're thinking, so, <laughs> I don't know. I said to myself, I don't know what this is because I'm not thinking about marriage. I'm not thinking about a relationship. I'm not thinking about anything. And then as the, the announcements for uh, food was made and certain tables were called out, my table was called out. And so as I went to, uh, it was a buffet and I went to get the, my particular meal I had to pass her and as I passed her she said something and she said oh are you going to get um, some dinner for me <laughs> obviously I, I thought well, well of course <laughs> of course I will and I responded like that and she said no 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 I was only joking I was only joking I thought oh but what came across is that she noticed me and let me just say, throughout that day, and I'm not saying this is how you're going to meet your person, but this was a sign for me. This was a witness in my spirit. God, I believe God spoke emphatically into the situation. And throughout that day, as I would do what I was, I was there as a main photographer, as I was taking photographs of the guests on this occasion, I would pass her and she would poke me in the side and, and, uh, and it's like, oh, and I turn around and it's her. I'm thinking, wow, okay. I'm thinking, she cannot remember doing it, but I remember. And you know what it was, is that she noticed me. I believe that was, a divine connection. I notice her, but in a different way. 
the way she noticed me might be just because she had met me sitting beside her or whatever, I was taking photographs. But she continued to do this for, throughout the ceremony. And I'm saying this because I'm sharing something. And um, what it was towards the evening, I just, I just asked her, I said, uh, or was it that she asked me? She said, what is your name? And I just said, Chris, as in Chris. Uh, I said, Chris, and she said, you mean Christopher? I said, no, Chris, as in Christopher. And uh, I said, but you know what? I haven't even got your name. And she said, oh, my name's Grace. I said, in fact, I've, I've got all these beautiful photographs. And uh, I don't know where to send them to. And she said, and so I said, where is it you live? And she said, Luton. Now for me, I'd never heard of Luton. Luton could have been a hundred miles in Scotland. It never, the, the name Luton didn't mean it. I said, God, where is that? She said, oh, um, don't worry, it's out of London, but don't worry about it. I work in London. I said, oh, okay. But she said, I said, oh, can I have your contact number and such forth so that when it's ready, I can send you the photographs. Now, what I'm saying is this, I've been doing photography for a long time, but something inside of me compelled me to turn that processing, the processing of those photographs around in about 48 hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's the quickest I've ever turned around the um, processing of photographs. And I remember ringing her. And um, when I rang her, she said, oh, who is this? I must have rang, this is a Saturday, I rang her on a Monday. She said, oh, oh who is this? I said, oh, it's um, Chris, um, the photographer. I said, oh. And I told her that I had the photographs ready. And she said, oh, that's quick. And so for me, there was this desire to meet her as quickly as possible. And I remember I, I said to her, oh, shall I deliver them to you personally, um, Luton? Or sh she said, no, I live in, I, I work in Farringdon. And uh, she said, I can meet you after work um, tomorrow or whatever. I said, perfect, perfect. And so I, I said, I'll meet you at such and such a station and everything else. And so it is, I had processed these photographs in a day. I'm talking about God moving upon your situation. And I'm sharing something here because things don't always go how you have perceived them to go. But you know what? When God puts somebody together, you know that it is God. And I remember. I remember um, waiting at the station and what I didn't know then is that Grace doesn't always keep time. I didn't know it then. <laughs> so I was waiting for about an hour. And so I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, am I gonna see her again? Is, is she gonna let me down? I'm thinking, oh, I, you know, and you get a bit anxious because you really wanna see the person. Not so much about the photographs, but you want to really wanna see that person. And so she comes meandering in after an hour and says, oh, I'm sorry I'm late. Um, I, I bet you thought I wasn't coming again. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I knew you was coming. <laughs> but I knew there was anxi anxiety on the inside of me. But the reality is this. When we engage, when we, when, when, when we met, I said, I'm just taking you somewhere. And uh, so we got on the train and this train went on for 30 minutes oh, and uh, 35 minutes. And she said, where are you taking me? I said, never you mind. When we get there, I will tell you. And so we arrived at Kew Gardens. And uh, she said, oh, Kew Gardens. I've never been there before. Now, I wasn't interested in the flowers. I was interested in the flower, Grace. And so 
<laughs> I remember we, I was speaking to her and, uh, and I'm saying this and God will give you a sign. And for me, he gave me a sign. And uh, the sign was this, is that I began to speak to her in a way that as though I knew her, I'd known her for years. And, but I, what God, God anointed me on that day to speak prophetically. And uh, so I spoke prophetically and I said, oh, you're like this, you're like that, you do this. And she says, how do you know that? I said, I don't know, I just know. And I was speaking to her and I started to expound the rhetoric, so to speak, and said, oh, you're the person for me. Um, you're, my, you're, you're my wife and uh, you, obviously that must have come across as a shocker because suddenly a second time she's meeting me but you know what when God speaks to you you can say certain things and you say it in the confidence of the Lord speaking through you and I spoke to her and um, let me cut a long story short what happened is that um, we went to a restaurant and uh, I ordered the food and the food came, sat before her and uh, I had my plate of food and I tell you the truth, and this is the truth, it's the, it's the first time in 40 years, and I've been 40 years with her, married to her now, that she didn't eat her food. Grace loves food. She didn't eat, I said, why aren't you eating? <laughs> She said, I don't feel like eating. <laughs> and uh, she never told me why at the time, but I realized why. Because I had spoken so many things into her life concerning her. So she's thinking, and then I'm talking, she's not saying no way, no how, you know, I'm not marrying you. I don't even know you. She's not saying that. She's just listening. But I'd spoken and she lost that appetite for the food. And uh, I left we left there and um, we, we continued to keep in contact and such forth. And you know what? As I said, I spoke prophetically and said, I'm gonna marry you. We're gonna be as one husband and wife. And you know what? I never, uh, I never, um, what's the word? Um, proposed to her or anything like that. You know what, we just, from that moment, we just planned the wedding. And uh, it was just seamless. We planned the wedding and uh, in a year, within a year, we were married. And uh, you know, that wedding to this day, which probably underpins who we are as a couple. We're, we're very much alike, we're very creative. And that, that wedding, was the uh, talk of the town. It was the wedding of the year in Christian circles. It was the wedding of the year. And it was uh, featured in a magazine and everything else. We did things that people never did at that time. It was um, silver service. We had a band, we had all the best singers, all the, um, we, God enabled us to do that. We had the best singers, we had, uh, a lot of ministers that are pastors and bishops today, they were at that wedding and people gave their services free. We had a beautiful day and uh, it was just one of those weddings and uh, we couldn't have planned it any better. And uh, you know what happened is that you can get in a situation where these things happen and you almost live in, you're, you're in a bubble because you're thinking this is like fairy tale. The reality is, is that you, you go for an experience like that. And then we went on the honeymoon and everything else. We went to, I think Jamaica and um, Miami, um, America. And, uh, and then the reality of this, you're with somebody that's new and you really, really don't know everything about them. And so there was, a lot of interaction and friction, even on the honeymoon. And you think, oh, this is not what I signed up for. And she would have said the same. But the reality is this. 
whom God puts together, let no man put asunder. And when God is in the midst of it, where Jesus Christ is part of that threefold cord that should never be broken, you know that you know that you know that you're with this person for life. And uh, 40 years on, you think to yourself, where did the 40 years go? I can't. We've lived, we lived an exciting life. And it's not a life based on, in comparison with other people. It's a, just a life based on God's call on the both of us. We've done, we share the same heartbeat. We share the same mind. We share, the, we have similar giftings. We complement one another in so many different ways. And um, you know what it is, is that you go through times when for me, you, I may forget what God did. And you do things within a relationship and you think to yourself, I shouldn't have done that. And you regret doing those things. And, you've, and you um, have to go back and then God reminds me that this is your life partner. Has there ever been a time when I ever thought of divorce or anything like that? No, not personal, not on a personal level. In other situations, in other relationships, people get divorced for a whole lot less. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, what happened to long suffering? You know, long suffering means it's a fruit of the spirit. So there's things that you have to develop. There's character that you have to develop within a relationship. And when you're going through hard times and you're pressed on every side financially, emotionally, you have to trust God and you have to know who you're called to serve. And one of the things that we have done as a couple, we've always put God first. If it was a matter of putting our ambitions first, we, I suppose in a, in a funny way, would accomplish a lot, a lot more on a material and a financial level because we're both very gifted. And there's a lot of things I could have done if it wasn't for the gospel. And I, I, but I say that with, not with regret, but I, I say that because I'm pleased and I'm glad that we put for God first. And Junior said something yesterday and he touched me because he said, he said, um, there's things that Pastor Chris does or is accomplished. And it's not all about money. It's not all about material things. It's not, it's not about these things. But what it, what it is, God makes provision. It's evident that God has made provision for him to do things that other people in ministry that pursue money and things, they pursue it to a fault, so to speak. But it's something that I've never done. And we've never done because we've always been reaching out to the re unreached and touching the untouched, whether they be abandoned children or a tribe or a people. Even this platform, reaching out to each and every one of you, not because of us, not to establish ourselves, but to establish you in your God given call, purpose, and destiny. And um, you know what? You can do things. As a couple, when you know that you're in, in agreement with the Lord and you do it not by your spirit, it's not by your might, but it's by the Holy Spirit. It's by his might. And when, you, when you're called to be strong in the Lord and the power of, your might and of his might, you have to know that it's in the Lord because what happens in, you may go through your troughs, your valleys and your mountaintop experiences. And in, when, especially through your valley experiences, you can say, I want out. But you have to, having done all to stand, stand and declare the glory and the victory of the Lord. You have to be continually reminded why you're in this position. Is it of God? And you know something? God has enabled us to live a life that we don't 
think about, I don't talk about it, but life of a, where we've accomplished extraordinary things. We've seen almost the world together. I don't, I don't talk about it because I can't, I don't know the extent of it, but I know that we've, I've been to most everywhere in the world. And I think to myself, I did that without any money. I did that without pursuing the wealth and the riches and everything else. Because there's something that's called favor, grace. And when you have grace, you have, an you have the enabling power of God. You have his favor, you have his mercy, you have his love. You have his peace, you have his joy. You, it's something that God gives you. It's not something you manufacture in yourself because if you manufacture it in yourself, then you, it's based on your soul pursuit. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. I read that scripture. It's Proverbs 13, 12. When you have your own assignment, when you have your own vision, when you have you you in a relationship, when you can you can be so self-centered that you don't even think about your partner. There's things that I know that even when it's been hard on Grace, I've made demands on her, but she's always made the sacrifice and vice versa, and we've made the sacrifice. You have to be pliable one with another because you're, 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 you're in partnership, you're one with the Lord. You're one with the Lord. And um, there, there is so much I can share, but the thing is, this is what I wanted to do. I really wanted to say to you, look, keep trusting God. Keep believing. There's things that will happen out of relationships, even in your own relationship, and the fruit of that relationship will be manifested. It may be a child. It may be two children, three children. You're not with that man. You're not with that woman at this moment in time. But the fact of the matter is, is that there's been a byproduct of that relationship. That byproduct is a blessing of God. And you might say, well, couldn't have been ordained of God because I'm not with that person anymore. But you know what? Things happen. Things happen in life and it takes two oftentimes to agree. I've, I've learned in my life that if two people don't agree, come together, if they're going through issues in their relationship, if they don't agree, you can't force someone to agree. And so rather than go down the route of trying to force someone, if they have a mindset, they just have a mindset, they're not gonna change. There's nothing, it's only God that can change them. Yes, you pray into the situation, you, you, you want the best for the both of them and you instruct them and you counsel them in the ways of the Lord. And you, you say, <laughs> you can say to them, exercise the fruit of the spirit. But them exercising the fruit, because fruit is something that you have to do, you have to develop that. It's not a gift from God, it's you have to develop gifts of the spirit, of things that God gives us because he loves us. And so a person can manifest gifts and it can be gifted and anointed in certain areas, but it doesn't mean that in their life, they conduct themselves in the right way and in the right spirit. And so you can see someone that, appears anointed on the on one side and behind the scenes they're they're um abusing their partner mentally emotionally physically and they're destroying the person but yet they're they're gifted they're anointed we have to be wise and there's something that we need to look at it takes two to make a true relationship with god it takes two I said true, divine relationship with God. It takes two. And I'm saying that you have, you might have different personalities. Personalities are things that are personal to each one of you that makes you, you. It's personal. But you adapt the character of God. And it's a character. The thing that's in your spirit, 
the character of God, God's love in you that enables you to grow together as one. And so that's the chord, the common denominator in any relation. It's the Christ in both of you that is the hope of glory. And that if you can find that middle ground in Christ, you can go through any situation that is demanding. Why I gone down this route? Because I really want to, and I, I, I don't know if God is really impressing upon me at this moment to talk about relationships on a broader level. But there's a lot that we've learned in 40 years of marriage. There are, let me say something. I'm not moved by outward shows of affection. And when I say I'm not moved by it, because I've been in Christ long enough to know that those people, you know, it's always amuses me. And it's not amusing, it disturbs me in a sense, because those people that seem to be lovely, lovely, tactile, you know, demonstrative, they're stroking one another, saying, oh, lovely, dear, oh, wonderful, my, my, the apple of my height, the, and all these lovely, lovely things. And they're doing all these shows of affection. You turn around, you two shoots you here they separated they divorced and thinking what <laughs> can't be how <laughs> because it's a show be true to one another and be true to god don't do what the world does do what god does through you if there's no two marriages that are exactly alike there's no blueprint for marriage but you have to find your place in that relationship and know that it's two personalities coming together and it's got to be identified through the character and through the love of God. It's the love of God that keeps, true love of God that keeps two people together. And the Holy Spirit that is able to change people. You can't change your partner. I can't, I couldn't change Grace. Grace couldn't change me, but you know what? The Holy Spirit changed me. I was not always a nice person. I did not always put her first, but the one thing I knew, I loved her. But when you're, gro when you're, when you're growing, and when you're growing up as a, as a young man, I got married when I was 24. Grace was married when she was 23. It's, that's, so everybody's doing their calculations now. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not embarrassed about my age. But the thing is, is this, you realize that you will have differences and uh, things will not always be ideal in your relationship. You, we would all like to emerge together in ministry, husband and wife, and you're doing ministry together. It doesn't always work out like that. And sometimes you have to balance or look at the roles that are God ordained for your partner. It's not always that you're if you're a pastor, that your, your wife is naturally going to be a pastor or a quote unquote be pastor's material. They might be just home tenders. And when I say home, they're, they're, they're looking after the children and such. They're, they're the mothers of the home. They're the matriarchs of the family. So they not, might not always be called, but you have a ministry together and you're there to supplement one another. And um, it's important to say, so. Some people may invariably look at relationships and say, well, there must be something wrong with the wife why the wife is not there standing beside her husband all the time in, in ministry. But you have to understand every person has a unique core, every marriage has a unique core. And you have to understand, you, you, I think about Mary and Joseph Mary was there to um, give birth to the greatest man that ever lived. Her purpose was to nurture that child to an age where he was going to be released into ministry at 30 years old. I don't know how long she nurtured him for, but the fact of the matter, Jesus was, there's, by implication, Jesus was with Mary and Joseph for. 30 years that was their assignment 
they were there. They, in fact, Joseph had the indignity of knowing, it wasn't an indignity, it was a privilege, God-given privilege, of knowing that he wasn't the father, truly the father of uh, Jesus from a biological perspective, but he was dear. And sometimes we have to define what our call is and not our call as a couple is and not always define it by the world's way of thinking. You are unique as an individual and you're unique when God joins you together. And you have to find that uniqueness in Christ. And I could read a whole lot of scriptures and I'm thinking to myself, if I start down that route, I never finish because there's so many scriptures that I can think of. But I just want to encourage you. I want to encourage you um, that keep on keeping on. Be a servant to the Lord first. You know, there's, there's things that I will say to you. I say, look, whatever God gives you, whoever God gives you, appreciate them. Appreciate them. Because when God gives you something, somebody, he gives you the best. And it doesn't matter because it's an institution of God and God loves you. And if you truly love God, God will give you the best. He will not give you something that is a, a counterfeit. He will not give you somebody that is going to lead you astray, that was going to take you out of your relationship with him. The father He's not going to give you somebody like that. If, if it is that you fight, and that's why that word keeps coming to me, be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what communion of darkness and light and Belial with Christ? Unequally yoked means that someone can have an influence, even your partner, someone that you think, I love this, but why do you love the person? Is it something that is based on your flesh first? Why, what is it you like their attractiveness? Let me say something now. And I say, I look at grace and I look at grace now and I think to myself, my God, I'm gazing at you in the way that I saw you in that vision 40 years ago. And I'm saying you're more beautiful now than you was in that vision 40 years ago. And I think to myself, oh. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And so it doesn't, let, let me say so. Sometimes we perceive beauty from a perspective of the world where we're talking about shape, hourglass figures and all that type of thing. The beauty comes from within. Let the beauty of the person be adorned in a person's heart and their character. And that's what I see. I see that maturity. And I say to myself, God, you're a good God. And you know something? When your footsteps are ordered of the Lord, they're ordered of the Lord. God, you find favor with God. And so, as I said, I, I don't know. I just feel that maybe we can continue in this uh, subject. And um, there are... There, there's a scripture that I wanted to read. I don't know if I should read that one, but there is also something that I'm going to go to this and perhaps um, another time I read the other part. But I'm just going to read this because this seems to be the foundation of um, what true relationship or marriage is when it comes to a husband and wife. And I'm just going to read it and then. I want some, I would like some feedback from each and every one of you. I know that many of you, as a, as a byproduct of relationships, previous relationships, you have children now. And uh, whether the man or the woman is not around, the man, the woman most, if I'm looking at this um, platform, the woman, the man is not around. There are things that, defined your reasons for you separating from that from the father's children or 
from your husband at the time. There are reasons. And these are true reasons, these are real reasons, but I'm gonna read something from the scripture. And, um, and I want us to look at this and uh, because here you have things that are based on foundational truths in terms of the word of God. And they are based on Paul's experience. So it's not necessary, it's his opinion, you see. And um, just like I'm basing what I've shared with you based on scripture, but also based on my opinion through my own experiences and relationship in terms of having a relationship. And uh, if you turn with me to 1 Corinthians 7, um, and I'm just going to read it. I may park the bus for a little while and just comment on certain areas, but I just use this as a foundation. It says, now as the matters of which you wrote, it is good, beneficial, advantageous, advantageous for a man not to touch a woman outside marriage. Well, we know that speaks for itself. It's advantageous, in other words, you don't get into emotional ties and confusions and complexes. Let me say something to you. When you, when you engage with a woman or a person or the opposite sex, what you're saying is that I'm requiring a level of commitment. And you might say, well, if it's a prostitute, right? whatever, not so. But in a, in a true relationship. And what I'm saying to you is this, is that it's advantageous not to touch a woman, not to go down that route because, or a person, or opposite sex, because you stir up emotions. And if, when you stir up emotions, to them, that speaks of a level of commitment. I have many I have examples around me where Some someone uh, people have stirred up the emotions of women, and because they stirred up the emotions, that woman feels that that person, quote unquote, is belongs to them, whether as a husband or not. But they be, the man belongs to them. That that's my man, you see, because you stirred up emotions, and uh, women are emotional people. They if you showed them. And the devil is a liar because having sex doesn't mean that you love the person, but in a confused state, your flesh will register this as, oh, you care for me and you love me. And so because of that, you may, one may submit to the feelings, the, the desires and the, uh, the feelings that are stirred up in the flesh and you submit to the advances, whether it be a man or a woman, let's get real, it happens. And uh, as it continues to happen, you think to yourself, well, that's my man. And so if there's another woman that comes onto the scene, no, that's my man, because he's with me, because, you know, and you may have all the credentials and you say, well, no, he's with me, because, and if it boils down to it that you're battling with somebody, and you all have uh, children that can identify. He's been with me, then it brings confusion. And so sometimes it's best to just leave it alone until the appointed. Marriage is honorable and the bed is undefiled. That's what the word of God says. So when it, marriage coming together as one is an honorable thing, and the bed becomes undefiled. In other words, mind your own business. It's up to the two of us what we're going to do behind the scenes. And when I say that, obviously, I would like to think, and I'd like to think that God is uh, still in the center of your relationship, even as the two of you come together as one. But the reality is this. It says, 
Now, as to the matters of which you wrote, it is good, beneficial, advantageous for a man not to touch a woman outside a woman, outside of a man. And touch doesn't mean just to touch. It means to go far deeper than that. Stir up the emotions. Promise them things that you're not going to deliver. Yes, I'm going to marry you. See, that's an emotional abuse. I'm good, but you have no intention of doing it. And so you get the person in a turmoil. But because of the temptation to participate in sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. So you, you can't say to yourself, all right, look, I'm a child of God. I love my God. I love Jesus. And say, look, I'm going to be friendly with somebody because you might have a perspective on your relationship, but they have a different perspective on it. And so what you might call as friends might be something that they don't call as friends. It's about an attachment. And so one thing can lead to another by virtue that people have emotion. Don't play with people's emotion. Don't play with it. It's not a good thing. You mess people up. Be true in your relationship. Say, say this is off limits. This is not for me. I ha already have a partner or I have my wife or my fiance or whatever. Do the right thing. Because you know what? The devil, the thief comes not but to kill, to steal and to destroy. And there's many a person, whether it be husband or wife, Oh, sorry, whether it be man or woman that has been at the end of such a relationship that becomes suicidal, they mess up mentally and emotionally, even spiritually, they, they shipwreck their faith, their faith in God has been shipwrecked. Don't do it. And he says, um, the husband must fulfill his marital rule marital duty to his wife with goodwill and kindness and likewise the wife to her husband and uh you know what that is fulfill the conjugal rights of uh, husband and wife in other words there are this as i said we are we are fleshly by nature and when I say by nature, we have a physical body which has emotion. And sometimes you just want to satisfy your partner or whatever the case might be. Don't use it as a tool to blackmail your partner and say, well, you haven't been kind to me. You haven't done this. I'm going to deny you. Because oftentimes that is something that will drive a person away from you emotionally to look somewhere else. So it's saying within the constitution of marriage, which is honorable to God, if two of you are in agreement, let, just do it. Even if you, and you might say, well, what if I don't, why am I talking like, that? what if I don't feel like that? <laughs> but you say, you know what? Because you love the person, you will, give in and it's not even given you will oblige you will accommodate the person you will accommodate your partner because you love the person you might not feel emotionally stirred up physically but once you set your path on delighting or fulfilling your obligation or conjugal rights so to speak then you'll find that there's a beauty in that. There is a beauty in that. And so what happens that that will aid other areas of your relationship. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised how many people, why am I talking like this? You'd be surprised how many people, uh, partners get grumpy if they can't get the thing. Because it's, are we below? Um, yeah, because if they can't get it, they get grumpy, they get miserable. And that's where the devil will come in and say, "Gah, forget it, forget him, forget that one, <laughs> forget that one." 
and you and mo moment you get to that point you leave yourself vulnerable as an individual to temptation and what it is is that your temptation may even lead you to the point of saying you know what let me just substitute this and let me just uh no i'm not gonna cheat on my partner but what i'm gonna do i'm gonna take the safe option so i'm gonna go to the internet in the confines of my own space and i'm gonna look at a few ladies online and you go through all these your imagination is just gone off a tangent a tangent and you start looking at these things online they call it pornography let me just cut to the chase things that seem fantastic in terms of relationship but they're not of god it's not real these are simulated relationships born, born out of carnality fleshly desire and you take that and you think yeah that will satisfy me but it corrupts the soul it and it can corrupt and bankrupt your re true relationship with your wife don't do that no, they didn't have internet in Paul's days. So <laughs> there was no internet. So uh, I'm just interjecting that because it's a reality. The wife does not, that, and it says here, the wife does not have exclusive authority over his own body, but the husband shares with her. And likewise, the husband does not have exclusive authority over his body, but the wife shares with him. So. Hallelujah. So you mean to say, my wife can't say to me, this is my body, you can't have me. Well, I'm just saying by mutual consent, I'm saying by mutual consent, you say, we are one and let's do the right thing. And you have a way of an approach, every man has a way and approach of uh, um, doting or uh, pursuing your partner. You whether it be a husband or wife but you have you have your own approach and so i'm not here to tell you how to do it i'm just here to say just do it according to the word of god you see and he says um do not deprive each other of maritable rights except perhaps by mutual consent for a time so that you may devote yourself unhindered to prayer but come together again so that Satan, you see, Satan, Satan will not tempt you to sin because of your lack of self-control. And that's the truth. That's look, you, you, I don't care who you are. You might say, well, I've got control over my flesh and I'll mortify my members, which are upon the earth. I'm telling you, there are things that can scream at your flesh because the devil knows your weakness. He can scream at you and you think, lord have mercy and in a momentary lapse you can succumb to the devil's will and so it's important to distance yourself distance yourself from that finding yourself in an uncompromising position or an in uncompromising environment but verse six it says but I am saying this as a concession, not as a command, as a concession. In other words, he's expressing his wisdom and his counsel here because he doesn't want to become legalistic, but there is wisdom in abiding and following the word of God. I wish that all people were as I am, each person has his own gift from God, one of a kind and one of that. And one of that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows that as a practice matter, it is good if they remain single and entirely devoted to the Lord as I am. Now, Paul is saying that he's entirely devoted to the Lord. And sometimes you can get to that point. It's not it's not compulsory that everybody's going to get married. It's not compulsory. It might have been um, the purpose of God for man and woman to come together as one so that they would populate the earth. 
first and foremost, so that God's kingdom would grow first and foremost. But it's not for everybody. It's like saying this particular office is for everybody. Not everybody's called to the same office and you're not called to the same constitution or institution of marriage. You're not. Some people, I know people, um, especially the women, they say, you know what? I'm happy being single. I'm fulfilled being single. I love God and I just love the, the opportunities to do what I want to do and as God calls me. I mean, and when I say I want to do it in a sense that I'm available to be used of God at any time, he instructs me. It's nice to be in that position. And Paul was in that position where he was, <laughs> let's, let's put it like, he didn't have to account to a family. So he's off on ministry and you can imagine he's traveling all around the world and everything else on the mission field as an evangelist and as an apostle laying foundation. And if he was married, then he would have to account for his wife being somewhere and uh, longing for him and not being able to always get to her so that her needs would be met. But these are things that as two people, you, you, um, you discuss and you arrange and you, you find out what is suitable under the direction of the Holy Spirit. And as a matter of course. And uh, so it says, but I say to the unmarried and to the widows that as a practical matter, it is good if they remain single and entirely devoted to the Lord as I am. But if they do not have sufficient self-control, they should marry for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. And so um, it's saying there, if um, for some people, it's better to marry rather than to burn. And when I say burn, you know, you, you can't, you, you just agitate it on the inside. You just, you, you understand what I'm saying? You just feel that you need somebody. And if you just have this overwhelming desire that overtakes you, that you just need somebody, maybe then by God's grace of God, God will allow you then. And when I say allow, we can make our own choices in life. And many of us have made our choices in life. But, and, uh, and then it doesn't work out. But the one thing I know is that God knows the end from the beginning. And if there's a byproduct of that, that you have children, and you have grandchildren, even for the purpose of the grandchildren, God knew that you would be in that position. And so God has a way because he's a loving God. The very offspring that you have may be a blessing beyond your expectation. Yeah, the man is not around, the woman's not around, but you know what? My generation, they're around and they're making an impact. They're, they're reaching the unreached and touching the untouched. They, the gospel is being spread through the offspring and so there's nothing i don't see anything as being a mistake because ultimately god knows all things and uh yes we do make our choices and there are consequences for doing the wrong thing there are consequences and sometimes we have to pay for those most times we pay for those consequences of doing the wrong thing but what i'm saying to you is that don't look back if there's been a result of children, don't look back and think, ah, oh, you know what? I messed up with my life and you've got children. Children are a blessing of the Lord. And God has a purpose for children. You were a child once and look at you now, you're an adult. So God, <laughs> you've grown up as an adult. So there's a purpose for each and every one of you. And so don't look back in wonder and think, why am I here? You're all here because God ordained that you should be here. And so there's always, and there's that quote unquote, there's always a silver lining in every, and through every situation. Look for the best of your situation rather than the worst. And he says, uh, but to the married believers, 
I give instructions. Not I, but the Lord. That the wife is not to separate from her husband. But even if she does leave him, let her remain single or else be reconciled to her husband. And that the husband should not leave the wife. Now, that's pretty emphatic. And you might say, well, look, is that, is that a law? Is that a given? Now, look, let me just say this. Life is about fulfilling God's ordained purpose for your life. That's what it's about. And uh, there are situations that, that you can confront you where you're in a relationship, even with your husband, even with your wife, and they're abusing you mentally, emotionally, physically, they're abusing you. In other words, they're stopping you from fulfilling your divine purpose in God. And you might say, how is that? Well, if you're mentally and emotionally messed up, some, in many cases, you're not at liberty to serve God the way you want to serve God. And, and so what happens is that you might feel suffocated, you might feel downtrodden, you, your self-esteem goes, everything goes from your, your identity, you're missing your true identity in Christ because there is a suffocating partner who's abusing you. God does not call you to be beaten to a pulp and so that you're, you're full of trauma. God does not call you to that. That's the devil at work. Does not, God does not call you to be continually bombarded by negative words. And that, you know, sometimes people say sticks and stones may hurt. Sticks and stones, how's, it, how's that saying go? Sticks and stones. Sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt you. That's the one, that's yeah. the one. <laughs> Hallelujah, thank you, Daniel. Yeah. Words do hurt you more so than the physical beating. And you might say, boy, I much prefer the words. No, you don't, because the words can, you can be healed of the wounds some many times, but the words that resonate in your, your spirit, in your heart, for you can live with them for a lifetime and it impacts upon your personality. I'm telling you the truth. And you think to yourself, why is that person like that? But you never reckoned about what they'd been through. The emotional, the mental, the physical abuse that they can't even know whether it, it was day or night. And you're, they're thinking, wow, let me get God save me. There's many, I've met many Christians like that, sat them down, ministered to them, even had to take them through deliverance because what happens is, the soul becomes so crushed and uh, mangled that the, the devil oppresses them to a point where they don't even know, why am I here? And you have to deliver them. When I say that, Christ delivers them from that oppression. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went about doing good healing all that was oppressed of the devil. And the devil oppresses us through our weaknesses, through our, our vulnerabilities, through our kindness even, the devil will abuse us. But as I said, but let me read verse 10. But to the married believers, I give instruction, not I, but the Lord that, the wife is not to separate from her husband, but even if she does leave him, let her remain single or else be reconciled to her husband and that the husband should not leave his wife. You know, that's an instruction and an opinion at the same time, because there are, there are I believe there's always reasons why you should leave some, leave some. If the person is a mass murderer, and they killed your daughter and um, killed your son and killing you at the same. Are you going to sit there and just let them kill you also? No, get out, get out, save your, save your soul, save your life. 
But I always believe that if God be for you, then who can be against you? No principality, no power, no devil, no demon, no man, no woman, no situation, no circumstance can be against you because God is for you. And I believe God has a way of it. God has a way of enabling us to escape from situations that is, that's crushing us. And I would imagine many of, uh, uh, probably about 80% of people on this uh, platform, you've been through situations like that where you've had to escape out of a relationship. The conditions might be different, but you've had to escape for your life. And in verse um, 12, it says, to the rest, I declare, I, I not the Lord, since Jesus did not discuss this, <laughs> that if any believing brother has a wife who does not believe in Christ and she consents to him, to, consents to live with him, he must not leave her. And if any believing woman as an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not leave him. So it's all a matter of consent. How do you consent? Do you agree? Is it accept? Don't just leave somebody. I mean, some people, and I know there's, a, there's people that, um, you know, God saves them. In, you're in a relationship with someone, God saves you, and uh, the person is unsaved, and they might feel, well, I'm a Christian now, I should get a Christian husband. You know, God, God is God. God knows how to draw people by his spirit, by the Holy Spirit, so that they will receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord. There are some people, it might be immediate, that after you get saved, they get saved. But some people, it takes time, it takes a season. But what it's saying in effect is that, don't just leave the person because you're now a Christian. What gives you the right to think that <laughs> you're better than anybody? You were formerly unsaved. You were under the government of Satan. You're under a different rule. And so you're not under a new, found, uh, new covering in Christ Jesus, but it's by the Holy Spirit that that came about. It can come about for your partner. And I believe that as you're a believing Christian and you're believing for the best for your partner, these things happen. People do change. They give their hearts to the Lord. The, the family gets saved. If there's children, the family gets saved. It happens. But don't just be dogmatic and legalistic and say, that's it. I'm off. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> what about the children? Don't forget it. You're, you're, you're not Christian. <laughs> I'm off. <laughs> no. That it, no. Just allow the Holy Spirit to direct you and trust God. But I, there, are, there are situations and circumstances, obviously, if you find that that partner might be, as I said, abusive. You know, your eyes are open now. You are born again Christian. You're thinking this is, they're stopping you from serving God. In other words, they're restricting you from your natural relationship with the father. You can't go to church. You can't do, then you have to question, hold on. This is the devil. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke, I break every curse in Jesus. You've got to fight against that. Are you going to risk this, the devil? Submit yourself under the mighty hand of God. Resist the devil and see that he flees from you, flees out of your relationship. You've got to be militant, militant in Christ because your home is the dwelling place. Your sanctuary, you are the dwelling place, but when you're there, you become the priest of your home. If you're saved, you become the priest. Whether you're a man or woman, you become a priest. And so you take control of your domain in the name of Jesus. Don't mean to be intimidated by the physical disposition of a person. God is able. But some cases, you have to realize that God will not allow you to stay in a position like that. Um, I'm looking at time. It says, um, 
verse 14, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified. That is, he receives the blessings granted through his Christian wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified through a believing husband. And this is why I'm saying sanctified means that blessings, you're, the, the blessings, the ability to bring increase to an environment comes through the one that is saved, whether it be a husband or wife. And so that impacts on the family. So, so it's important to know that. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified through a believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be ceremonially unclean, but it is, they are holy. But as it is, they are holy. And they are holy until the day of accountability. So if you have a child that, you know, obviously was conceived out of wedlock and such forth, and you are unbelievers, whatever, get married and such, you, you stay with your unbelieving partner, you sanctify, you cover by virtue that you are now a part of that priesthood. You are a holy, you are a royal priesthood. You become a priest in your home. And so by virtue of that, you sanctify your children until they're an age of accountability that they can decide for themselves whether they serve Lord and receive the Lord as their personal savior. But if the unbelieving partner leaves, let him leave. In such cases, the remaining brother or sister is not spiritually or morally bound, but God has called us to peace. And the whole thing about this is that we must all be called to peace. There's nothing, you know what? Oh, Jesus. I've been through so many, um, I've counseled so many people where I cannot understand it. I must be, I don't know if it's me, but okay, you fall out with your, your, your partner or your spouse or whatever. And then that person who you was in a relationship for numberless years, 10, 15, 20 years, all of a sudden they become, they become the arch enemy number one. And it's as though you never knew that you want to crucify the person, you want to kill them, you want to defame them, you want to strip them naked, you want to take everything from them. I'm thinking, how is that? The person who gave birth, you know, who gave birth to your 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 children, you just want to take everything. People become so callous. And, and, and when I say people, I know it's a work of the devil, and I recognize who's that who's at the root of all this. And so remember this, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in hybrid. The devil is strategic. And because marriage has been instituted by God, he wants to do, destroy the very thing that God stands for. That's why he fights it. That's why you have all these things going on about gay marriages and all this type of thing. And, you know, I read some things, I can't even repeat it, that it can go to an extreme. Bestiality and all these type of things become legalized in different countries. I'm thinking, bestiality, you can almost marry a beast now. Something's gone wrong. Talk about lasciviousness. And, um, but, the fact of the matter is this, is that, but God has called us to peace. If at all peaceable, possible, live at peace with all men, even your ex-partners, even your spouse, even your ex-boyfriends, even if at all possible. For how do we know Verse 16, how do we know, wife, whether you will save your husband by leading him to Christ? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife by leading her to Christ? You don't know. It may well be God, God has ordained it because God will speak. God is very strategic. He may speak to the person, one person, then speak that person. He speaks through that person to another. We always have to be sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit and not just be emotional 
emotive all the time. Only let each one live the life which the Lord has assigned him and to which God has called him for each person is unique and is accountable for his choices and conduct. Let it, him walk in this way. This is the rule I make in all the churches. And I'm just going to stop there. I'm going to stop there and I'm just going to say, look, we live in an age where the institution of marriage is not valued as it was before. And, uh, you know, obviously people are taking a mockery out, man and man, woman and woman. Okay. We know that's the enemy. That's the devil. The devil is a liar. So he will always bring in falsehood. But in respect of as believers now, I say to you, don't compromise your situation. Don't put, compromise your position. Don't go for second best. Know that God can give you the best. You know, I, I, I thank God that I have somebody like Grace in my life. We complement one another. We have the same heartbeat. You know, if, see, Grace will do things like Grace, <laughs> Grace can go out on the street and see someone that's homeless and uh, hasn't got no money, ain't got nothing, and just say to the person, oh, come, we got a room, you can stay with us. She doesn't even ring me, she just says that. I come home, see a man, <laughs> you know, who's he? <laughs> And you know what? It's just exactly the same thing I would have done. And so she knows how I would respond to a person in the same situation, in that situation. And we would respond like, that's two hearts coming together as one. And major decisions, spiritual decisions, there's a knitting together that you become of one heart, one soul, and one mind. It's a very important. And so, um, there's much to be said about a lot of things which I just um, addressed today. And I, as I said, I felt impelled um, from yesterday, you know, um, when I just expressed, be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. You can have unbelievers that are in church. Yes, them being in church doesn't make them a believer. It just makes them sit in church and go to church. <laughs> it's like someone. As I always say, you know, you can see someone walk into a garage with overalls and a, 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 a box of tools. That doesn't make him a, him a mechanic. It could be um, parading as a mechanic, but give him your car and you find out whether he is a mechanic or not. <laughs> see how far you get down the road. No, that's just an outward show. And there's so many people that have an outward show of spirituality or religion but like their, their hearts are far from God. So un, the unbelieving, the unbelieving churchgoers. And so even when the Bible says, be not unequally yoked with unbelievers, you have unbelievers in the body of Christ. So don't be fooled, don't go on. And I, let me say, there's no hard and fast rules, but some people, they will go on, um, dating sites and all that type of thing to seek a partner. I'm not saying that you can't do that, but did, were you guided by the Holy Spirit? You see, were you led by the Holy Spirit? Not everything is for everybody. And I always say that. What fits some, you can't look at somebody and say, oh God, that's a beautiful dress. I want one that exactly like that. When you put it on, because your makeup, your curves are a little different, they don't it doesn't look right on you. But it looks beautiful on that person. You have to know what fits you. And so that is so important, so important. But bless you, bless you um, this morning. I just really want to pray. And as I said, it, it's a hard thing sometimes because you will meet people and you think they're well-meaning but get direction from the Lord. Don't be led astray, led astray, led astray by 
emotions or feelings because Pope deferred, as I said, makes the heart sick. Hope deferred because you're hoping, you're longing for and everything. And it's, it doesn't seem to have materialized. You're looking for, God, I want to get married. I want to do this. I want to do, yeah, God, you know, my, my desires are sincere. And that those desires might be born out of insecurity and fear. Let it be born out of love, true love for the Lord, seeking him first. God knows what you have need of even before you ask. And so I always believe God knows best. I did not seek my wife. Grace did not seek her husband, but God brought us together. And the important thing is to know that God is real and God loves you. He loves each and every one of you. And he wants to give you the desires of his, your heart. Your heart connected with the heart of the father hallelujah so it's according to the will of the father put the lord first and i, I know it sounds blase and it sounds simple doing that but love god love god god will orchestrate your footsteps i believe that and god knows your heart god knows the sincerity of your heart and he knows what is best for you but believe god for the best and pray for the best. Don't pray for an individual, pray for the best. God will bring that person to you in the appointed time. In the interim time, just keep on keeping on doing good and God will bring you his blessing. And so I'm just gonna pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you. I thank you, Father, that by your spirit, I was just moved to speak in this area. And well, whether this is a catalyst or the foundation of something that needs to be addressed in more depth, addressed in more depth in the body of Christ, let it be so. And let it be addressed with integrity and love and sensitivity, not condemning, not judging, not writing people off, but giving them a sense of hope that God's way is the best way. And so, Father. Even in your word, you said, flee every appearance of evil, or even flee fornication. Father, because, because of our human nature, because of our, us being mortal beings in a sense, there is that part of us, that in, instinctive animalistic part of us that desires the thing to fulfill our carnal nature. But Father, I pray that even as I've spoken, that we may address it not on our own, but through the aid and the help of the Holy Spirit, that we will commit and position ourselves. In other words, we will to do the right thing. Our will is so important as we will to do right, right thing. You will infuse us with strength and ability to overcome the temptations that will come our way. And that even through the entrance of your word and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we will ward off the sleight of hand and the subtleness of the, and the fiery darts of the wicked to fight off these things that will look to confuse us. So Father, I pray that you empower us today, bring healing to those souls. Many of us were suffering from the remnants of or the residue of past relationship and even we have made inner vows to say you know what because of this past relationship i never enter into another relationship with, again we know that that is an inner vow and that invariably can bring a curse over our lives father let us leave it to you to make that decision and so father i speak to every heart that is been affected in that way that has been there's been a distortion on the perspective of how they see relationships and marriages i pray there is a divine healing in their souls in their minds and in their emotions and in their will right now in jesus name father i pray for temperance right now 
and a heart of forgiveness that they can release those that are have been at the root of this sense and this feeling of being undone, victimized, violated, whatever the case might be, and rejected ultimately, but disrespected. Father, I pray forgiveness to those people right now, and that they, we will have it in our hearts to forgive right now in the name of Jesus. Take out the root of bitterness right now. I, I come against that root of bitterness right now in the name of Jesus. I break that curse, that inner vow right now. I revoke, I renounce, I sever, and I destroy every vow that we have even sworn over our own lives. I destroy it right now. And Father, as your daughters, as your sons come into alignment with that, Father God, I decree and declare that they're healed by the stripes of Jesus. Because Jesus himself came to heal all that is, was and is oppressed of the devil. And by the stripes of Jesus, we are healed in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray that you will give them vision and foresight. You will order their footsteps. You said in your word, you will not withhold any good thing from them that walk uprightly in right relationship with you any good thing let it be a good thing let it be a good wife let it be a good husband yes lord because you are able to do that father i pray your grace and your strength bring peace and where there is no opposite sex give us the strength the fortitude of mind and the strength and the ability to put our flesh under subjection. The, the longings and desires of the flesh, let us subdue them and let us put on Christ with all his expressions of his love that we know, will know what is our divine and true purpose in him. So Father, I pray divine direction, speak to your sons and your daughters. Speak in a way that they will know, that they will hear, that they will see what is the right thing for them. But Father, I pray that they will be their hearts will be fulfilled, their lives will be fulfilled with and consumed by your desire to serve you, Lord, first and foremost. Thank you, Lord. I pray. I pray right now. I pray and I proclaim. There will be divine relationships going forward right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I decree and declare this day, a momentous day, a memorial day. Father, this is a new beginning. Father, change of mindsets right now. Let there be a renewing of the mind. And Father, I decree and declare the mind of Christ the mind that will remove every burden and destroy every yoke of the devil. Every yoke, every hook of the devil will be destroyed that has been sent to destroy us. Let's destroy your sons and daughters right now. Build an impenetrable head around them that cannot be broken by any demonic foe. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I plead the blood over the lives of every believer in the hearing of my voice, in the hearing of your voice. Let you, Father, you confirm every word through them with signs following. Father, I thank you. Grant them the patience that they need. Patience, endurance, perseverance, even as they undergo trials, tribulations, and testing. Grant them it. Give them it. Empower them, I pray. Father, I commit everything into your hands. This day, this day, this is the day that the Lord truly has made, that we should be glad and rejoice within. And so rejoice, saints. Truth will make you free. A lie will only serve to disappoint and to destroy you. 
Father, let them not be sick in the heart through their own time scales or their own their self ambitions, but let it be led and directed by your spirit, Father, I pray. That they may know that which is a good, acceptable, and your perfect will for their lives. Father, I thank you and I bless your holy name. In Jesus' name, let everybody say amen and amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Praise be to God. If anybody wants to respond in any way, um, please, you can take the opportunity to do so right now. Um, I trust that you will. And uh, so I open up if you want to pray into a particular area. If there's an area you, uh, you have a question about, you can ask the question. If you have a comment, you can comment. Whatever the case might be, I leave it to you in Jesus' name. Anybody? Yeah, I think, uh, I think, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chris. Yay. I think it's uh, very important to, uh, to, to take, get rid of the flesh, get rid of the, uh, the carnal mind, um, and become born again. When, because then, then when you're looking at your, you're looking at women in a different way. And then you'll 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 see the heart of like you said with Grace, you saw her heart when you were taking the, the camera. You saw her heart. So then you see when you're born again and when you're in a good relationship with Jesus Christ, I think that's important. That's what happened to me in 2018. Uh I gave my life to Jesus Christ and the, the lust went. And then I started looking at the spirit. You start to see the spirit and you start to see the heart of the of the people, of the of the ladies. Um so I think that's very important. So once you're in that situation, once you're in that stage, uh, it shall be well. Um, that's all I've got to say, really. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for that, um, sharing that thought. Um, it's important. It's important to put God first. And as I said to you, um, you know, most, in every given situation, in any relationship, you have to develop the fruit of the spirit. <clears throat> this is your expression of your love towards God. And uh, you have to develop the fruit because the fruit will give you the foundation and the strength. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's a byproduct of the character of God. It will enable you to go through situations that in your own strength, you're not able to do it. And so it's important to know, um, you know, and sometimes you go through things, you just don't know. It just seems so insurmountable. And there's times when you share things with people, even if you share it with people, they only serve to put you down even more, or they, they use it as a, a weapon against you. If you share certain things, or your, your vulnerability and such things. So, you know what? Sometimes it's just about you and the Father. And you, by God's grace, as, as he knows your heart, God will work the situation out. And uh, that's important. That's important. And God will speak. God will speak in the midst of a situation. God will speak. Bless you. Um, is there anybody else that you want to pray or just have an expression? Everybody's shy this morning. Keith, go ahead. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to run out of the door soon after. Um, for me, I have to kind of be truthful and honest. Um, it's interesting the, the typicalities of what people may go through or what people may build because I'm completely out of the remit. So I was, I had to kind of run and go and grab sweets because I've been crying a lot because I fall out of the stereotype and it makes it harder and it makes it a little bit more tough because it's not 
typical for me. And I know that I've got to lead and work on God. Because half of what I know in my life is it's the answer, no. It's not, oh, well, you could just learn. And, you know, it's just a, a, a time that you kind of go through. It's all I'm going through. It's just, it seems to be an answer, no, and be redirect. And I'm always having to redirect. Finding things out when you're not in a relationship. So we talk about lust. We talk about intimacy, the stereotypes. It's very interesting. So when you talked about pornography, tears get falling because for me, pornography did nothing. It didn't help me. It broke me. You're seeing two people on the screen enjoying yourself themselves. But my kind of thought process and rationale is like, how can I get excited about two other people enjoying themselves? Because all I'm thinking to myself is you're sitting here in your flat or your place or your residence and you're with nobody how like it's interesting how the enemy works but for me it broke me down even more because it didn't work for me it didn't it was like mm, wow am i that atypical that's kind of how it feels so when i'm walking into this next journey this next position potential that's what i put it as potential i don't think i don't claim her as my wife because the bible says to guard your heart but in guarding my heart it hurts too because i have to obviously be wary be vigilant be like those on the the tower walls to be watchful because the enemy comes he plagues we, we can't just look at God is just doing, but remember God has to also allow because lessons and teaching has to come from the, the allowance of God too. You, you can't just go be looking at the, 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 I call it the whimsical life, the fairy tales, because there's always a lesson and development. And while listening, I'm just, I'm recanting. And I thought, Lord, if, if the enemy's going to speak, I'm going to write this stuff down because I know that I need deliverance. I know that I do. And it's 22 different things. It's, it's ooh, wow, Lord, okay. That means I've got work to do because we always do, right? We always do. My free relationships that I had, for an example, none of them were favoured. None of them were great. None of them, it wasn't even on the basis of lusting after. All I actually wanted to have was friends. Huh. It's, it's quite crazy. All I really wanted to have friends and then they just kept coming around and coming around. And I thought, okay, cool, we can just carry on. And then when they said, oh, you know, with all the things that we're doing, it wasn't even with the intimacy side, because remember, I'm coming from a place of rape. So laying down in a bed with somebody, when they start touching me, I want to go. I want to run. I, I want to just, mm, and it's uneasy. It's it's really uneasy. Even in the times now where we're, we're in the holidays, so there's more people on the trains at the time that I'm going to be on there. It is uneasy. I can't bring my dog with me because normally I actually had to teach her to, to speak for me because people don't hear me. Excuse me. It's uneasy. So I just tap my chest twice and she bucks and it's like Moses in the Red Sea. They move. But for me, it is just, it's this relationship side of things. It's atypical. I'm looking in the word and researching. And I'm like, Lord, look, this is amazing. But my life isn't this. So I have to kind of sift between, you know, like when you're sifting for gold and you want that little tiny micro nugget and that can bring you great riches. But it's a lot of sifting. Like, I mean, even, even for me in people's mistakes comes a blessing for me, but my mistakes, my choosing of mistakes in being in a relationship with the three that I had left me with deprivation, confusion, and brought me back again to childhood. And uh, red flags, red flags, red flags. That's, I'm struggling with this. I, I'm, uh, I hate to use the term broken, but I'd rather be real. 
I'm, I'm broken by this. So with this new potential relationship, it's there are so many things. It's not just one sided. It's so many directions. And I know I've got to trust in God because what he puts together, what he brings is always good. But again, we forget the enemy can also bring and I'm like, Lord, so I'm praying and I'm praying. So I, I lean and I trust, but I still got to be mindful because it could be another enemy illustration. I mean, look at Job. Trust me, I keep coming back to that scripture. Why don't you curse God and die? I, that was whom people could say God brought to her, but look where the enemy sat in. Be, be mindful, be careful, be watchful, be vigilant. This is what the Bible says. It's the parts that, that seldom get remembered because where your flesh is weak. Paul said it, your spirit doesn't speak so highly. You, you feel, you, like you said, you feel, you're doing by feelings. I'm like, Lord, I'm just confused. I'm not saying completely yes, because I said, Lord, I've also got to ready myself to be prepared to say no. This isn't going to work. It's not even the temptation from her. I can actually say no. And I've said to her, no, because of my uneasement, my, my sexual problems. Let's be real. My sexual problems are many. How do you think I'll get to 28 health issues? There are many, and now I know them. People don't know them until they get into two long-lasting relationships. And people kind of either have the choice to stay or leave. And I'm not against, I had to say, Lord, you know what? If she leaves me after time because of my problems, I can't be angry at her. Because she's got desires of her heart too. So I can't just think of myself. But where does that leave me? Lord, wow. My name means courage through battle. But I, every direction, like I'm standing on thin ice. And it's cracking everywhere. And I need to take a step because it's not safe. That's kind of, that's probably the best analogy that just come to me. And I'm just, I need some prayer, just. Amen. Yeah, just need some prayer. Hallelujah. I um, don't want to say another thing because I'm kind of concerned. Sorry? I, I dare not say another thing in this, in, in explaining a bit more because I'm just at the point of breaking down again. Okay. Well, you've heard our dear brother, um, Keith, and uh, he's openly expressed. You know, the, the, the thing is, trials and tribulations are unique to each and every one of us, and we encounter them in different ways. And, and, and when, when the word no, by no means highlights or underlines every situation every different situation that's going to confront you, every temptation that's going to confront you, every, you know, sin that is likely to tempt you. It, no way it does that. But what it does, it gives pointers. And uh, we know that, and the one thing is this, through violation and through um, deception, through lies, just through pure, pure abuse, God, the devil can look to have a stronghold in our life, you see, and it's overcoming those strongholds. And we know, I, look, God is a healer, and uh, God can heal any situation in the name of Jesus. And uh, I just believe that, you know, this is a, this is a real thing, um, as Keith has expressed, that he's going through. And... Uh, you know, but in the midst of it, the word is still the word still speaks, and his desire is to be delivered of these underlying emotions that came to keep uh, coming up in his life, and uh, the challenges that he faces when he comes to, you know, entering in or uh, at the point of entering into a relationship with the opposite sex. You see, and 
they might not be uh, from different people's perspective, but it's from his perspective and it's very real. And see, the same decisions has to be made through the Lord and through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have to have direction from the Holy Spirit. We have to rely on the divine protection from God. We have to expose the devil if it's a lie. You see, we expose that lie. And uh, we have to recognize that there is a God that is able and that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And the thing is, is that without labeling everything, we can know that whatever that situation, nothing is impossible for God. Nothing is impossible for God. And so it doesn't, it, in, it might be unsurmountable in terms of from one's own perspective, but in God, it's, it's nothing. God can heal. By the stripes of Jesus, he healed us 2,000 years ago. And so I just really want us to, let's just stretch our hearts towards um, Keith right now. And um, I'm just going to pray. And this is not me. I'm just going to pray that Holy Spirit will minister to him in a special way that will bring about total healing total restoration total wholeness and completeness and we thank god for what he's doing already doing in keith's life you know that even subject to many many diagnoses you know of uh, different illnesses and everything god is healed him in so many ways and uh you know what I admire Keith because at the end of the day, in spite of all things, he's still able to lift up the name of the Lord and to thank God and do and serve in the kingdom of God. And that takes great strength and great courage. And that shows a love towards the Father that many doesn't, do not express in terms of serving and uh so i'm we're gonna pray we're gonna pray right now i'm gonna pray in the name of jesus father god in the name of jesus i thank you even now i commit your dear son keith you know him by name you know him by nature you know the very purpose for which he was Created Father, even before the foundation of the world, you knew him before he was even conceived in his mother's womb. Father, you knew the things that he would suffer. And so we know that, and he may not have realized that at times, but his cross that he carries is his cross that he needs to bear. And we all need to bear crosses, Father God, because life is not tiptoeing through the tulips, but there's something that you will do. And even in your word, you said, there is no temptation that is greater than man. In other words, there's no trial, there's no tribulation, there's no testing, there's no suffering that is beyond human comprehension. Because God with the trial will make a way that we're able to escape it. In other words, be delivered of it, set free, made whole and complete from it, be healed. And so I speak to Keith's situation. I do not speak in words of man's wisdom, but I speak and I decree a declaration of the power of demonstration that by the stripes of Jesus, he was healed 2,000 years ago. And right now, I decree upon his spirit, on his soul, and upon his body right now, every hurt and every pain I speak to right now, I pray that your healing balm will be applied to his soul right now. In the name of Jesus, Father, take away every dross. That is not of you, Father. Take it away right now. In Jesus, every residue of the past that is still hindering them today, Father, I speak healing right now. In the spirit first. In the soul. 
and in his physical body. I speak it now. I take authority right now. As in the, the authority that has been invested in me and that we have been invested with right now to decree and declare that every tie to the past that is, that is holding him back, Father God, every fear right now be destroyed in the name of Jesus because Father, you have not given Keith the spirit of fear or trepidation or dread, but of power, inherent power, and of love, the agape love, and of a sound mind, a disciplined mind, a controlled mind, not one that is perplexed, not is one that is torn between two or three opinions, but a controlled mind, the mind of Christ. And so, Father, I come against every high thing that truly exhorts itself against the knowledge of you. And I speak, speak your divine wisdom and counsel to his spirit right now that will lead him through a, pay, a path onto a path of divine and complete and true deliverance, Father. Father, I thank you for your grace and I thank you for your peace that is multiplied to Keith right now through the intimacy of knowing you. And Father, he cries out to you, he desires you in such a way that you truly hear his cries, his voice, and you answer him because you are a loving God. And so Father, I thank you. And I pray Father that in his life, every door that should be shut will be shut in the name of Jesus. And every door that will be open will be open in the name of Jesus. I pray an open heaven over his life. And Father, whatever we bind right now is already bound in heaven. And whatever we loose right now in his life is already loosed in heaven. And so Father, we release your divine partner to him right now that will come manifest and be affirmed and confirmed at the appointed time. You speak to him that he knows, that he knows, that he knows. Father, we thank you for your very best for him in Jesus' name. Father, those tears express your love, his love towards you and your love towards him. That he could be moved by tears. A broken and a contrite heart, you said you not despise. You not turn away, Father. And so, Father, I know that you've heard his cries and you've seen his tears and you relate to his pain. Through Jesus Christ, by his stripes, he, he is healed in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you and we bless him. We bless him at this time. Give him answers. The answer is already there. It's Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, our Savior. Yeshua Amashia, we thank you. The Anointed One, we thank you. We bless your holy name. We bless your holy name. We bless your holy name. Father, I decree and declare that every word spoken or unspoken over his life, every curse be destroyed in Jesus' name. And every spirit of those curses, I command you to loose and let go and take your flight right now. Every ungodly soul tie with his remnants of the past, I be destroyed right now in the name of Jesus. Father, he's building and he's built on no other foundation but Jesus Christ. And so we decree your sovereign will over his heart right now. You are the governor. You are the shepherd of his soul. Lord and Savior, Jesus, we thank you. Amen and amen. Amen and amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Praise be to you. Praise be his name. Is there anybody that would like to express or even pray at this time? I'll give you just a little window of opportunity, and then we're going to close in Jesus' name. I just uh, carry on that prayer with the Keith. Uh, you know, the Bible says, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. So touch. So uh, I just um, plead the blood of Jesus over his body from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet, an anointing of the, of the blood of Jesus Christ to fulfill his life and to take away anything that doesn't need to be there, any spirit that doesn't need to be there. Be gone, be removed right now. You are destroyed. You, are, you, you have no place in his body. You, you are not welcome because he's a, he's a child of God. He's a child of the Most High God. He's anointed by the blood of Jesus. And he is fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God, in the image of Jesus Christ. So get your hands, get your dirty hands off Brother Keith right now. You are not welcome. In the name of Jesus, goodbye. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen and amen. So be it. Well, bless you. Um, I thank all of you for coming on this uh, morning. And uh, I just pray that we continue to lift up one another and just to be mindful. I just, I'm very mindful of uh, every one of you. And uh, as God leads me, I will pray for you as individuals and collectively. And uh, I just pray God's strength. And at the end of it, it's just a testament. It's a testament that we will all gladly declare of how we overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testament. And so let there be a celebration in everything we do in Jesus' mighty name. Let it be a victory shout. Hallelujah. Because we're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. So be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Have a blessed weekend. Um, again, we are we are um got Saturday meetings, Saturday clinic, and um, you know, obviously we can continue to come together to pray. I trust in as many of you can join us on the Saturday. And then we have the Sunday service. So hallelujah, praise God. We're going to be blessed by a song as we leave. I have been uh, touched in more ways than one by what God has expressed and impressed upon my heart. And I know that is by God's spirit. And uh, we know this is an area that needs to be addressed on a wider level. So I will just see what God will have us do. There's so many practical elements of it that we can address and in, input into our lives. And uh, so time would afford us to do that. And so, but let us all be led by the spirit of God. And let's hear the voice of the father in everything we do in Jesus name. Amen. Go ahead, Keith.